Okay, so I'm going to get through this in the next uh, 25, 20 minutes. Okay, so I'll be talking about the kind of things we've been doing at Leeds and how it fits in with the HighSense project, which I'm coordinating. So I'm going to present the idea, okay, very quickly, the vision, the concept, talk about the technology, okay, then a few case studies, which are quite interesting. We do a lot of case studies. And finally, a conclusion, okay? So I'm frightened to say that I've been in the biosensor field for a very long time. I initially was a core electrochemist, straight electrochemist, and we got this idea from the Weizmann Institute in Israel in the 70s and 80s, where you coated a mercury drop with uh, phospholipids, and you've got very, sorry. yeah, sure, very stable layers, and we found that these responded to different uh, toxic species like peptides in exactly the same way as vesicles. So, Bish Brash Bosch, we had a wonderful membrane model, but as you realize, no one's ever going to use a mercury drop nowadays, especially with all health and safety in industry as a high throughput technique. So, from the last 13 years, actually, we've been uh, concentrating on getting this system safe and usable. And what we did, we put the mercury onto as very thin films <laughs> on platinum electrodes on the chip. And in that configuration, it's extremely stable. And the mercury is totally bound to platinum and it's very, very safe and we insert the whole lot into a, a flow cell, okay? And that's the idea we had over 13 years, and we worked, and we patented it, and the patent's now been granted, so we call it the biochip. The reason you use mercury is that it's the only real system for getting really good supported layers. No other system works, believe you me. Mercury is beautiful. Like in that way. Okay, so when it's in a tiny thin film, very safe. And then the way we use it is we throw a sawtooth waveform fast across the lipid layer. We get these two capacitance current peaks, and the whole thing comes up as this kind of cyclic voltammogram, and that is very responsive to anything which interacts with the lipid. Okay, so I'll give you an example. And this is to a pharmaceutical thyridazine, okay, antidepressant or psychosis treatment. And we look at our profile. Oh dear, so, oh here it's working. And in we inject the thyridazine and bish bash bosh peaks go down, so it's very fast. So we aim for speed. So you can really screen at about uh, two minutes a sample when you take count of all the replacement of layers and so on, so it's very fast. Okay. So what's our vision? How did we come to the high sense? Well, I thought, well, okay, we've got a lovely flow system. Here's our flow system. Here's a module, membrane module, and the membrane's on the chip, and it's all connected to a computer, but it's only one module. And I talked with Yvonne Cole from Fraunhofer, and we thought, well, hey, let's have a membrane module, but also have a DNA module, and also have a cell module, and a line module. And we'll build these all up, and the whole Gavins, the whole system, will replace the rat because it's similar physiology. So that will imitate the whole physiology in a rat. And that I wrote up and it went through and we got awarded the grant. And well, the whole idea came from this modular flow system. Okay, 
So the concept is to have a fluidic modular configuration, which is a step change from the classical well plate testing methods. And then the other idea was to have a PBPK model, which you've heard all about yesterday, which underwrote the whole system. So uh, we've got a partner, Peter Shimon in Bratislava, who's developing that. Okay, so I'm going to talk now specifically what we're doing at Leeds. Okay, so we've completely rationalized our membrane module system. So it's completely high throughput, it's small, it's cheap, and it's fast. And we've got syringe pumps, tubes, flow cell, potentiostat, electric acquisition boards, and the whole thing's automated. And uh, flow cell is deep technology being developed by postdoc Josh Owens. And as you can see, the chip slips in there. And then we've got our electrodes at the top, a flow in, flow out. And there's our double peak RCV format, which is our output. OK, so that's really being developed and is one of our deliverables. OK, so now I'm going to talk about some uh, case studies, OK, which are really interesting. We really have been screening masses of things. If, when you can take two or three minutes to screen a compound or a nano material, you can really do loads and loads of interesting work. OK, so the principle, the metric, the metric or parameter that we measure are these RCVs. And what happens is when you get a compound interacting with the lipid layer, the RCV changes, it's extremely reproducible. And we want to get a quantitative measurement like you have log P, okay? Okay, conventionally, our quantitative measurement is limit of detection. It's the minimum concentration of compound or nanomaterial which affects the form of the layer. And the form of the layer is defined by this profile. So we then measure the, say, the peak depression, and we get the minimum significant point concentration, which affects that membrane. And actually, that's a very interesting quantity, because we've done a whole big project with a company. I, I'm not allowed to say who the company is, OK, where we uh, looked at a whole load of uh, low molecular weight compounds like toluene and so on. And we wanted to see exactly where our technology fitted in with the conventional log P measurements, which all the uh, pharma companies do according to their regulations. And when you compare the uh, LC50, which is narcosis of fish, okay, with the log P, this is in fact from the uh, uh, mobilized artificial membrane test that they all use, you find that the correlation is pretty good actually. But when you do it, the same correlation against our LOD, the uh, correlation is much weaker. And there's a very good reason for it, because what we're measuring is membrane modification, okay? So we're screening compounds and nanomaterials for membrane modification or disruption, not for membrane affinity, which is not P. It's a different measurement. So we took this further and we looked at uh, what is our biomembrane sensor really telling us about these compounds. And we know in our RCVs that the peak shift is a potential profile. The peak depression represents absorption of compounds. The baseline increase is penetration of water into the layer. Sensor layer, we also measure sensor layer recovery. 
So what we were actually finding is that actually we were saying a lot more, not just uh, about the membrane interaction, but about the type of membrane interaction. And when we compared our results with Cosmomic, which is a standard program for uh, looking at compound uh, membrane interaction, we found we got very similar results. We got two compounds, trichlorobenzene, uh, chlorobenzene and trichlorophenol, and one of these compounds, uh, chlorine, is replaced by an OH. But when you interact these different compounds with the layer, you get quite a different profile. Here, you just get a shift of the peaks and a depression. With the phenol, you get a depression of the peaks and an increase in the baseline. And this is showing that the compound is disrupting the structure of the layer far more than benzene compound. And that is reflected in the cosmomic results where the cosmomic profile for the compound in the layer is far more restricted, okay? So it's even more interesting with these uh, trimethylammonium compounds, for instance, they show us in the uh, RCV profile an absorption in the surface, okay? And we can see that also in the cosmomic profile where the compound is located at the surface of the membrane. But when we go to benzylamine, the neutral compound, it actually penetrates the layer. And we can see this in the RCV and also in the in the cosmomic because the compound is going right in the layer. So what we're, our result is telling us a far more in-depth study of how the compound affects the layer that you don't get from simple log P measurements. And another series of experiments, I don't want to go too long, but we've performed with uh, silver compounds, organic compounds, where we've looked at a whole series of these uh, organic uh, uh, putative anti-cancer compounds. And one of them, uh, the, the compound has got a silver in this, uh, this, uh, inserted in between on, in the compound. And the silver, all these compounds interact very strongly, as you can see, they depress the peaks. But the silver actually keeps the compound in the layer. It prevents the compound from coming out of the layer. So you can see in the yellow peaks, this is when we wash the layer, it recovers back to its original state, more or less. But when there's silver in the, in the compound, the compound is actually held within the layer. So I guess the message for this is that we can actually find out a lot about the nature of the interaction from these very straightforward Profiles. Okay, so on the other hand, the relationship between our technique and standard, sorry, uh, uh, toxicity techniques very much depends upon the mode of action. So we're measuring membrane damage where toxicity is due to membrane damage. We have a correlation. We have a good relationship. And the example of this is uh, intercalibration we did with all our consortium, where we looked at three different compounds with different toxicities, okay? These are different compounds. And with RCV, we found that chlorpromacing was the most toxic or greatest response, the MMS less, and the colchicine even less. And when we compared these results throughout the consortium, including uh, Michel using different uh, cell cultures, we found exactly the same ranking. So in that case, these compounds are, are damaging the cells through the membrane action, and we correlate exactly what with 
the, yeah. of the results. So the message there, yeah, yeah, that's fine. The message there is that you have to take account of a mode of action of a compound before you come to any simple conclusion about the correlation. Okay, I've got a bit more. Okay, so finally, I'm going to talk about our nano material. We've been screening nano material with this uh, sensing system for quite a long time, for a few years. And in fact, we really can, it's really valuable in screening nano material because we can see whether the nano material interacts with the lipid. We can judge where what it does to the lipid and so on. And this is, and the, the beauty of it is that you can screen the nano material when you've synthesized it. So you can have that screening system online and you can screen at the point of synthesis. So this is gold nano material and gold nano material interacts strongly with the sensing system and intuitively, obviously it depends on particle size. For instance, five nanometer gold particles interact much more strongly than 50 nanometer or 20 nanometer. And these are all citrate coated. You want the minimum uh, other contaminant in the system. And uh, it's a beautiful, well-behaved system. And you can also see that because this baseline is increased, it indicates the gold is actually penetrating the uh, monolayer system. And um, we've done this work for two years now, and to validate it that we're recording membrane damage, we've compared it with vesicles, and you can see this is our sensing system, where the five nanometer more sensitive than the 20, and it shows a depression of certain concentration of gold, okay? And when we compare it with vesicles and the breaking open of vesicles due to membrane damage, you can see that the whole system behaves exactly the same. The vesicles are more damaged by five nanometer than 20 or 50, and the concentration effect the threshold is exactly the same as within the monolayer. So that answers the question, is, is our system relevant to a bilayer system? Yes, it is. We've got numerous other evidence to show that. Okay, so going back to yesterday and Nick's wonderful talk, I lifted up my ears, okay, and we did a whole paper on TIO2 screening, and we looked at anotase and rutile and P25 and all these different forms of uh, TIO25. It's published uh, three years ago. And we found that the anotase was the most active. You can see where the rutile is pretty inactive. When you look at it on the microscopy, the rutile looks much more bit, much bigger, although they said in the brochure that it's exactly the same size. But we also did a whole series of titrations. I like traditional methods. It all appeals to me. And we uh, titrated the charge on the particles. We found that, in fact, the uh, anisase had a much greater capacity to hold charge. So altogether, it was a much more active uh, particles. So that was a really interesting study, which we did. And uh, okay, so how do we align with the uh, PBPK model? Well, this is the simplest. I mean, I'm not experts on this, so I wait to be corrected by experts. But uh, it's the simplest PBPK system where you have a group of cells, you have blood in, blood out, and in your expression, you get K, rate constant for absorption over desorption, uh, desorption, gives you the actual accumulation in the cells, okay? But 
how can we fit into that with our very simple system? Uh, well, we can actually measure these individual weight constants for adsorption and desorption from membranes. And we, we're in the process of doing this on some data from some silica adsorption, where you can see silica particles are very active with lipid membranes. They depress these peaks. We've done, and we actually put our sensor in the TEM, and we found the silica particles were close packed on the surface. This is also published. But what's very nice, we can measure the rate of absorption of silica particles on the surface, which we've done, and we've related that to the concentration of silica, and then we've got a conditional rate constant, and that's related to the nanoparticle diameter. The bigger the diameter, the slower the rate of absorption. And then we can, we can convert that to a critical coefficient to an absolute rate coefficient for the different sizes. And if we extrapolate to zero diameter, which is affects a single molecule, we get a rate constant of 5.7 times 10 to minus 5 centimeter per second, which is actually the uh, interaction of silicon dioxide uh, a molecule with the surface. So we can actually uh, get uh, fundamental rate constants and we're, from our system. We're very happy about that. So to conclude, at the right time, uh, what we are at at the moment is that we know per se that our membrane module registers membrane disruption modification specific to compound structure which is interacting or a particle which relates to the orientation of compound in the membrane or on the surface, etc. That the response to soluble bioactive compounds is correlated with cell based assays which membrane uh, measures registers membrane damage. We've also proved this uh, very recently in a collaboration on membrane active peptides, which destroy membranes. We get a uh, very positive correlation with them. It's sensitive to the size and functionality of nanomaterial and correlates exactly with damage to vesicle, bilayer, monolayer, uh, anomaly, uh, uh, it's not an anomaly anymore, and it can be used to measure parameters for input into the high sense PBPK model. Okay, so I'm finishing there, and I've got so many acknowledgements that I'm just saying thanks to the consortium. We've got a wonderful consortium. I'm very proud of them, as I was telling Barry. And we do work a lot with people in Leeds, Charlotte Willens, and funding. I'm, I'm getting a lot from NERC because of our environmental application, and also EU. We're 